Hi, this is Daniel Ryan with Odessa After Dark. On this episode of Odessa After Dark, Zach Harar will speak with Jonathan Horn, who's the director of a new play at the Black Box entitled A Night with David Merriman. And we will have a new book review by Randy Hamm. But first, we will talk about the developing story of Rene Escobar Sanchez. If you remember, Rene is the first story that we ever did on our May 5th episode. Rene went missing um, four years ago from his house. He walked um, away from the garage. We talked to his uh, wife, Esther. Um, we found out that he was at a party and the last person to see him was Miguel Vinegas. Um, we learned this week um, that Miguel has confessed to the murder of Rene Sanchez and so we will bring you the latest of that story. Well, I'm here with Susan Rogers. We're back together um, as we were on our May 5th um, episode to talk about Rene Sanchez. Um, because since we first talked now this week, um, Miguel Venegas has come forward to admit that he was the person who murdered Rene. Not just the person who saw him last, but he actually murdered him. Um, now, he's not convicted of this. He's still, how would you? I would be the a suspect. A suspect. So he is in jail right now. Correct. Since um, Sunday. Yes. Now, when you first heard the news, were you surprised? I was a little surprised. Um, glad that it that it came forward. You know that he decided. You know if he is the one and it's true and his statements are true and what he did. You know that he did come forward and tell that so that we could, you know, get this case wrapped up, give, give the family a little closure. Now you said earlier um, this is only one of three missing person cases that were solved since you've been here in 25 years. So this is is pretty rare. It's it's pretty rare um, on this, and you know, it, it, the cases I was talking about were not just missing persons, but unsolved homicides as well, where you actually have an ending to it like that. And it it, it is rare. Um, it's from my experience the four years. That's a short time, you know. I mean, we've got we've got them on the books that are twenty and twenty five years old, you know, and they're still looking for for, for something in those cases. Um, so it, it is rare. Um, I will say the Odessa Police Department and um, uh, the detectives over there, uh, the the lead detective in this case has been on top of it from the day that she got it. Um, she's been uh, very involved in it. I know a lot of times people will think that you know nothing's being done or, or, or nothing got done or whatever. And when cases go cold, I mean, there is no further information. There's nothing else she can work off of. But she's the kind of detective that she um, she never let it go. She never closed the book. You know, it was always there. Um, it's on her desk. She kept looking into it every opportunity she got. She was going back and looking at things and reviewing it and going back over it and kept it out in the forefront, kept it in, in her mind. And she's been very diligent in the work she's done on the case. And that's Detective Reyes. Detective Reyes, yes. Now she, um, uh, back when she first got the case, she actually um, um, knew that Miguel was the last person to yes. to see um, Renee, and so she's trying to follow up to get him to uh, admit what he had done. Right. And so, um, as we know now, though, he um, basically came forward um, out of either um, guilt or duty and confess to yes. having uh, done this and so but we still have as of this point when we're recording this we still have not recovered Renee's body that's correct they are they are there I know that um, every every possible person that can be out there looking right now is there um, the department is, is is empty because I've got everybody out there doing that trying to find that that body and though I've spoken to Esther twice um, in the last few days and so the family has um, taken the news rather hard. Um, 
you it's like the only way I can think of it is like when you buy a lottery ticket you always have that hope you may have won the lottery mm -hmm. until you know otherwise mm -hmm. and so they had this hope um, that he'd walk right that back he in. walked back in mm -hmm. and they went to Target the last tip that you received was somebody saw him at Target and so they did a search and passed out flyers at Target mm -hmm. and so they even though um, it was doubtful they had never given up hope and so I, I think losing that hope has been the most painful yeah you know we talk about it from a law enforcement point as saying that there's some closure to it you know we do we know what happened now we know what the outcome is you know um, and you know in, in law enforcement where you're closing a case and you're doing something like that you know it's it's totally different from being part of that family you know it's 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 the beginning of something else for that family as well it, 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 it's telling them what happened and now they've got to go through the grieving, process. the grieving process, and you know, do do everything that they need to do, and, and then the, the judicial process after this. I mean, you know, it doesn't end here. That's a that's a thing that's a, that's hard for victims. A lot of time is, you know, it, from law enforcement's end of it, we get an arrest, we get them in jail, we get them into court. Well, the family goes through that the entire time as well, and it's just, uh, you know, as a family member, they will see that through to the end, and and there will be another mm -hmm. grieving process when they get to the end of that. Well. As far as, um, let's re uh, recount what happened the night Rene um, died, is that he was at home. They had a barbecue that day. Um, he left about 11.30, uh, mm -hmm. went to a party um, down the street where mm -hmm. he met Miguel. Mm -hmm. um, him and Miguel went to drink some more. Um, there's an allegation in the paper that they actually stole beer when they ran out. Um, and then um, sometime in the early hours of the, uh, I believe July 14th, um, that he stabbed Rene several times and left his body where they're now currently um, looking in West Odessa. Okay. And so that's where we are as far as um, what happened to Rene that night. Um, and that was four years, uh, about four and a half years ago. So now, um, does it make, uh, law enforcement's job harder to convict somebody after so much time? You know, it, it, it gets harder as the time goes by. There's more work that has to be put into it. But like I said, you know, kudos to the Odessa Police Department. They are absolutely on top of it, have really never not been on top of it. You know, just had to wait for, you know, you hear them talk all the time about you need that one break, and they got that break. And, of course, they're running with that. Um, it, you know, as time goes by, it makes things a little more difficult, but, you know, the, the detectives over there that are in place right now, they're, they're very, very good at their job. Um, due diligence is wonderful over there. They, they are on top of everything. They'll cover every base. They'll take care of it, and they'll make it happen. Now, as far as um, Crime Stoppers, um, as he was listed as a missing person, mm -hmm. um, has it um, uh, increased any tips? Um, this last few days? Not thus far because the police department has not had us ask for anything yet. You know, um, I, you know, if, if they if they come to us and tell us that they need to know some information about this or that or, you know, where he was seen later on that week or, you know, stuff like that, we'll go in and put that in. But they're not at that point right now. I mean, they're all, they are totally focused on finding that body. And so until they come up and say, you know, we need some more help with something else, you know, of course, if anybody knows anything, I mean, if anybody was with him after this happened or he said anything, admitted anything to them or anything like that, of course, we want that information. And we would like them to call us and give us that information. Well, after four years, there must be somebody who maybe saw him that night or... He talked to. Him. Or I mean, this talked is, to. This is not something you do and don't talk about it, you know, and... and the the person he talked to or the people he talked to may not realize exactly what he was talking about till now and they see this and they know that you know this is what he meant by what he said you know and so you know if you know anything if you were around him in those days afterwards and he was acting weird or you know or whatever you know that's information that the police could use and we would welcome that and as i was telling you earlier um ever since we, we talked i've been following miguel on facebook because he did have a facebook account and that um, he has um, a pretty large family in this area and so I would hope that maybe um, if any of them had any information that they would like to share anonymously this would be a good outlet yes, for them. Absolutely. We'll, we'll still take any information there. You know until the police department tells me to take him off of our side as a missing person we've still got him up that way. Um, we will go in and close that out when they're ready to do that but any information that anybody has about the events that led up to what happened we would still be interested. Well, thanks for, I mean, it's great to have an outcome 
Um, it's always sad to have this type of outcome, right. um, but it is nice that the police department did their work and that Crime Stoppers, of course, did their work and took in tips. You know, you guys have added a lot to this. The viewers that watch your program, they talk about it. You know, they, they talk about it out in the community, and that's what we need. I mean, that's what that's what makes your program work so well. That's what makes Crime Stoppers work so well is, you know, you keep it out there. We, we don't let people forget about it. Um, people who may know these things, you know, if you know something, if, if, if he happened to talk to you and you have information, you're going to be keep hearing about this. It's mm -hmm. not going to go away. You know, get it off your chest. Give us a call. Let us know. At least you'll know you told someone, and, and we'll take it from there. Well, and now that Miguel has um, confessed, I mean, there's no reason to keep secrets anymore. No, absolutely not. And so if you've got information about, about anything that happened that night or anything that he's told you, that's something we would be interested in. Okay. And so the number um, is? 333-TIPS, or you can hit our website at odessacrimestoppers.org. And then we will be back with Susan actually next week as we talk about what Crime Stoppers does and some of the other cases that they look into. So we look forward to seeing okay. you two weeks in a row. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're here on South Moss near Interstate 20 where the search for the body of Renee Sanchez is going on. This is the area where Miguel Venegas um, said that he left um, Renee's body. Um, so far, it has not been recovered. Um, when I spoke to Esther yesterday, there will be a service for Renee. Um, they are hoping, though, that they can have a funeral um, with the recovery of Renee's body. And so we're going to now show you some video from our interview with Esther um, about the night that, unfortunately, Renee was murdered. And so let's have that video now. I'm here speaking with Esther Armaderas, who is the wife of Renee Escobar Sanchez. We really appreciate you um, taking time to, mm -hmm. to talk to us. Um, I know some of the information about Renee uh, personally, but um, it's nice that you sit down mm -hmm. um, to talk to us to tell us a little bit more. So I'm going to ask you a few questions mm -hmm. if you're ready. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, first question, how did you and Renee meet? Um, we worked at Walmart together, and that's how we first met. And so, we were overnight soccer's and oh. yeah, so it, and so you you worked together, and then kind of went out on a date, and yeah, you know, we started talking, you know, and then like a date, you know, and then you know, everything, you know, from then on, it you know, yeah, we progressed. And yeah, how long were you two together before he went missing? Before he went missing. Like five, five, five years. Five okay. years, okay. And now how big is your family? How many children? We have two kids okay. together, um, a daughter who's seven and a son who's five. And so does Ray and I have any other children or just those two? He does have two other children. Um, as far as their age, I'm, you know, one in, his daughter lives in San Angelo and the son that lives here in Odessa, Texas. But they're older? Yeah, they're older. Um, I think his son would probably be like about maybe 12, you know, around there somewhere. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the most asked question that, that you've probably had, and you've probably, you know, thought over it, thought over it, but can you describe what happened July 12th? Well, I mean, I remember that day like, like it was yesterday, you know. Um, it was that Saturday we had... Um, I went shopping, you know, to have a little barbecue, just me, him, and the kids, and, you know, we went to the store and everything, we came home, and it was, you know, everything was going good, you know, and, you know, he cooked the barbecue and everything, and, and then, um, that's, well, pretty much, you know, a friend of his showed by, you know, stopped by, you know, and then left, and we came inside, and, and then he went back outside, you know, to go, he just sat in the garage to just have a few, you know, a few beers, you know, and um, that's the last time that I saw him was, you know. Okay, well now when he was in the garage, you were, and the kids were in the house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what were you doing? Well, the kids, they had went to sleep, and well, I went to sleep also, you know, but I think I woke up at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and um, I looked out through this window, and you could see the garage light on, so... I, you know, I assumed that he was, you know, still out there, so I didn't go out there or anything, and then I went and laid back down, and then I noticed that, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning came, I noticed that he hadn't came inside at all, you know, 
and that's when I went out to the garage and he wasn't, you know, I mean, he wasn't there, you know, and I was just like, you know, this is, you know, it's weird, you know, but I was thinking maybe he went with a friend, you know, or something, you know, and he's going to come back, but, but no, you know, that, you know, but that was the last time I saw him was that night, you know. And you said that the barbecue was just the two kids, you and yeah. Renee, mm -hmm. and then a friend stopped by? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And did the the friend take part in the barbecue or just... No, he stopped by for a few minutes and he didn't stay that long, you know, but he had told Renee that he would be back, you know. Um, I was thinking, you know, when I didn't see Renee back there, I was thinking maybe that friend came and maybe they picked him up, you know, and he's with him or something, you know. That's the first person that, you know, came to mind, you know, was to call him, you know, and ask him, you know, if, you know about it, but, um, I mean, eventually I did, you know, we did get a hold of him, but he said, you know, that he did come back over here, but everything, you know, I guess he must have came back over here when we had came inside, because mm -hmm. I turned off all the lights out there, and um, he said he did come back, but nobody was outside, so he just went home. And so. what, did he remember what time? He said about, I'm, I can't remember what time that he said, mm -hmm. but I know around the, la the last time I saw him was at 11, and his friend was there like maybe, maybe about an hour and a half before. You know? Okay, or, so obviously the police have probably in the last few years talked to him and... Yeah, they, um, from what I, from what I know, from what they told me, you know, that they that they have talked to him and, you know, but I guess he didn't find anything, anything there, you know, but that's okay. We will continue to follow the story as it develops. Um, this is not the, the end of the story because now we move from a missing person situation to a murder situation. Um, as I've been following um, a little bit about and gathering information on Miguel, um, his postings over the last several months have been very erratic. Um, this is someone who's been uh, deeply affected by alcohol and drugs, um, who um, I can't say knew his time was numbered, but definitely he had convicted. He had been convicted of other crimes and was uh, fearful of going back to jail. And so um, we appreciate everybody who's watched this story develop over the last several months. As I said, this was our first story we ever reported on. And though we are um, glad that Renee is no longer a missing person, we share in the um, despair and heartache that Esther and the entire Sanchez family feels um, that the end turned out like this. And so we do hope that we um, have a service and, and the police out here find Renee's body soon. So this is Daniel Ryan reporting for Odessa After Dark. Hi, this is Zach Arard with Odessa After Dark, and we're here at the Black Box at the Globe Theater on a bed with the director here, John Horn. So uh, I guess tell us what you do here. Uh, for this production, I'm the director. Uh, these are two plays that I've always wanted to direct, and uh, when a slot came open in the seasons, in this season for 2013 at the Black Box, I suggested these two shows. And, they agreed to do them, and so I directed them. So it's my my vision that you will see if you come see the show. And what are the plays called? The both plays that we were doing for our night of David Mamet are uh, the first one is Sexual Perversity in Chicago, and then the second one is All Men Are Whores and Inquiry. All right, and tell us about those. <laughs> Give us a quick rundown. Right, right up. Um, all Men, uh, All Men Are Whores and Inquiry is uh, a performance piece that David Mamet wrote in the 70s. Uh, it was originally done uh, by such great actors as Patti LuPone and Kevin Kline. Basically, it's just an examination of the primal side of men, uh, the thing that makes us sexually driven, uh, and just poses some questions about what sexual orientation men truly have and what uh, men truly want 
and I guess the, the, to sum it all up, it basically it, it, it concludes that men, we, we we're sexual beings, no matter which side of the fence we're on. It's sex. That's that's our big thing. That's what drives pretty much ninety percent of our thinking. And now we're here in Odessa, and this is the, these kinds of from the titles and the synopsis <laughs> you gave. It's a little bit of a departure from what usually goes on here. So, yes. how's the response been so far? Um, so far, pretty. Good. We we do have reservations, so I mean, people are going to come. Um, we don't have Westboro Baptist on our butts yet, or. Um, we don't have that neo-Nazi group floating around picketing us just yet. The advantage we do have, if anybody wants to protest, they can't because we're on the college campus. So we, we do have that going for us. Uh, I mean, they could probably still chunk Molotov cocktails and, you know, shoot guns at us if they wanted to. God forbid. I don't think that's going to happen. But um, it, it's a mixed response. You know, some people that we've told them what we're doing and they're like, oh, my God, and freak out. And they're like, y'all are going to hell. And some other people are like, wow, finally some culture in Odessa. So. All right, and the name of the other play is Sexual Perversity in Chicago? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, and tell, tell us about that. Um, sexual Perversity in Chicago examines even deeper, uh, you know, that primal instinct in men, uh, as well as examines how we let society, our friends, um, influence the decisions we make, uh, especially in what we think is attractive and unattractive. You know, that social norm that uh, magazines and television say is what it should be. Um, and it just follows the story of, of two people that basically they fall in love and then fall out of love in the span of, of the play. Uh, and it all has to, they're, they're both influenced heavily by their friends who um, have an attraction to them and want, they're, their friends are very selfish and just want to keep them to themselves. Um, it, you know, it's about the as well as it does delve into the sexual perverse nature of humans. Um, there's some really great funny moments. If, if you like, if you like Seth Rogen movies, Judd, Judd Apatow movies, Sexual Perversity is definitely the show for you. And uh, tell us the, the dates out. When can we see this? The dates. Okay, we open this Friday, which is January 11th. We have a show Friday and Saturday, the 11th and 12th as well as the 18th and 19th of January. Both shows start at 8 o'clock. Uh, to get tickets, go online to Mark10, the number 10, theatricals, with an S, dot com. Uh, you can purchase tickets online or uh, call the number that's on the website. Thank you for uh, without a doubt my favorite author ever. If there is an author that writes the way I feel, it is Michael Chabon. If there is an author who loves language as much as I love reading it, it's Michael Chabon. Telegraph Avenue tells the story of Nat and Archie, who are two men who run a record store on Telegraph Avenue in Oakland, California. One is black, the other is Jewish, and they're trying to save their independent record store while a big box retailer is moving in. And it really talks about not only race relations, but it talks about the difference between shopping local and what that do, does to a community versus a big box retailer coming in and saying they're creating jobs and not really creating them. Which sounds like very dry reading, but when you start looking at the relationships between all of these people, some who have ties to the retailer, some who don't, it really becomes a very emotional and very centered story. So I highly recommend this. Oh,